So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Michael Heesman, a senior lecturer in food policy and management at Harper Adams University, which is one of the oldest agricultural um, universities in the United Kingdom. It's founded in the early 1900s. I teach in the food department, which is tiny. We mostly teach agricultural students. In fact, we produce around a third of um, Britain's agricultural graduates each year. And it tends to be the sons and daughters of uh, farmers and landowners around the UK, including Wales and also some uh, contingent from Ireland as well. So we're sort of, sort of set up in a very sort of um, unusual clone, <coughs> quite small, we only have 2,500 students. So that's where I find myself. I've been there just, just um, over 18 months. So um, the perspective I'm taking is very much a slightly different from the mainstream agricultural approach. And I want to talk about social justice as fairness in the global food system. And in doing so, what I'm going to try to achieve in this presentation is to suggest some markers or some way in which to try and engage with some of the issues we've been hearing this morning and as a way to sort of start a dialogue to try and integrate some of the many pressing problems that engage us across um, the food system. And in this sense, I, just, I tend to think about the global food system as sort of rift by a sort of fundamental sh food chasm, mm -hmm. which is basically the food rich world, to simplify it to the food poor world. And I don't just mean that in terms of, you know, sort of you know, having money to buy food, important as that is, um, but it's about the inequalities in our food system, uh, but also in terms of the power structures within our food system and the economic, the rich and economically poor. So I try to capture this sort of chasm and where you go in whatever part of the world you see this sort of split, you know, in the world of food. And around this chasm, there's two fundamental sort of challenges, as I see it. And I write about this in um, the book, which I've co-authored with um, Professor Tim Lang, Food Wars. We sort of frame this around two big issues of human health and diet. And we're very familiar with that, from overconsumption to underconsumption and hunger, to addressing you know, the increasing environmental concerns and the use and access to natural resources. And included in that, we heard you know, sort of in the first speaker, you know, even access to land to grow food or produce your own food. But within this, this, even though these are two important, that's where you see a lot of the dialogue being framed around these two big fundamental challenges. But then a lot of other issues tend to slip between the cracks. And so what I'm trying to suggest is by understanding the food system in terms of social justice as fairness, we can start to integrate these issues and, and create a sort of way forward towards a big picture um, understanding of food problems. You know, increasingly, we just, you know, to address these challenges of human health and environmental health, you know, the, the, the mantra is, you know, feed the world. But, you know, often we don't sort of talk very much about, you know, how that's going to be done and in what way that should be done. And, um, you know, where I, where I work, feed the world means largely increasing productivity using new technologies and new techniques. Um, so I'd like to conceptualise this problem of how we feed the world as basically, and why we don't feed the world basically, as a failure of social justice and fairness throughout the global food system. And within this, I think one neglected area, as we've heard by all the speakers basically, is the health and working conditions of global food and agricultural workers. And this is the example I'm going to take just um, for today's presentation. And um, what I try to, to suggest by the, using the concept of social justice as fairness, which I'll explain in a little while, is that this can, a way to integrate responses to problems across geographies, and I, that was very powerfully put you know, in the case of Brazil, and its integration into global markets, and, the, you know, and these various problems that confront global food supply. And just to give you two examples, you know, there's, there's a lot of things going on out there. So I also try to think, suggest that um, social justice as fairness is a way to try and sort of perhaps, can we see, you know, sort of emerging trends and, and sort of things going on? And there's many fragmented responses. And in very simple terms, you know, we see some responses through the corporate social responsibility 
agendas of, um, of food businesses. And I'll just give this sort of um, example that we might have to start loving Nestle again. Um, because, um, you know, in, in Britain, in June, you know, they announced that they'll pay their entire UK workforce, including its agency or contract staff, the so-called living wage. I'll come back to that a little bit later. And they were the first manufacturer to do this. And of course, this is just in the UK, so we have to think about it in that. And globally, they did sort of, um, with um, sort of um, academics from uh, Harvard, they, they sort of applied this sort of creating shared value um, approach to their food supply chains as an alternative to a mainstream corporate social responsibility. And they start producing reports like this, Nestle in Society. And part of that, there's, it's, it's very, you know, that, that covers a wide range of issues, it's particularly environmental issues, but within that there are some, some concerns and metrics around um, uh, sort of workforce and employment conditions. So there's a, you know, even a company like Nestle, the world's largest food company, is starting to sort of somehow engage in a different way than uh, how it has in the past. And all of this CSR and these types of activities, they've only really started to take off in the past 10 to 5 years, although there is a history of some companies going back much longer. But, you know, we have to realise that, you know, the struggle goes on. And for me, a very interesting example of this is what's happening in, you know, among US fast food workers. There's been an amazing sort of coming together of fast food workers, often very difficult to organise or to, um, to work together, to try and, try and protest to increase um, wages for fast food workers in the United States. And there's been protests and strikes in more than 100 cities across the USA since um, 2012, and the major demand here is for a $15 an hour livable wage, as the Americans call it, which is almost twice the US federal minimum wage of $7.25, and also noted in that is the right to form unions. And Time magazine called this the biggest wave of job actions in the history of Americans' fast food industry. So when we see that you know, a lot of workers are you know, find it very difficult to organise or to try and protest conditions. You know, this is a, perhaps a prominent example it is, you know, that, of that, you know, there's a reaction against that. But then the interesting thing in terms of trying to get structural changes, 52% of fast food workers in the United States are reliant on some form of public assistance to top up their wages. So basically they get paid so little, it, the welfare in the United States, which as we can appreciate is not very generous, kicks in. So employers are using this, it's not just in fast food, employers are using this to keep wages down, you know, to sort of uh, keep the you know, workers locked in a very low wage sort of structure. And I just want to speak of, in contrast, these, the um, heads of fast food companies in the United States on average, their compensation packet was $24 million in 2013. So they have an annual income of $24 million. So you can see, it's very much a sort of a, it's a struggle in terms of labour and uh, management and, and capital. So just to turn to this idea of social justice as fairness. Of course, social justice is not new in food. You can only think of, um, we saw a nice example from you know, Charlie about sugar the sort of anti-slavery movement that emerged in, 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 particularly in Britain in the sort of 1800s, very much around reaction to uh, sugar slavery. And the way in which I'm sort of using this concept, um, or simplifying it uh, horribly, is was developed by the social justice, was developed by the moral philosopher John Rawls, um, it was published in 1971. And he, he doesn't talk about food, he talks, it's a very abstract piece of work, and um, uh, and he's applying it in this, in this very abstract philosophical way. But I've just sort of taken out some bare bones, you know, sort of, um, because one of the things I think is, is important is he talks about social justice as fairness, is that you need to sort of engage with the basic structures of society to enable social cooperation. And that seemed to be a very attractive model to think, because, you know, how can you engage, in a sense, um, sort of business, uh, government and uh, working sort of interests in some form of cooperation to solve some of these problems. And he talks about assigning rights and duties in the basic institutions of society 
and that how these can then define appropriate distribution of benefits and burdens arising from social cooperation. So even though I haven't applied this in any sort of empirical way, I just feel that this is uh, an interesting model to try and engage with um, what's happening around um, sort of the structures of global food systems and where we might sort of look for points to move things forward in a, you know, in a constructive way. So in that sense, I see that social justice fairness is a model to be applied at a structural level, rather than getting away, rather than the debates that it's all about you know, individual consumer choice. So we have to engage not just with, oh, it's just what we buy as consumers and get some information to change our buying habits, but also to get underneath into the sort of structural level of what's going on. And also to confront and to debate <coughs> what is seen as unjust sorry, unjust, and what is just and unjust in society. So we, you know, we can easily identify you know, what we consider as unjust in terms of human suffering, whether it be through over- or under-consumption, but also in the inequalities, which we've heard you know, lo you know, lovely display you know, in the previous talks, in power within the existing food supply chains. But then his rules, you know, in his work, you know, he says it's very difficult to reach an agreement over what is unjust and what is just. So I think there's a sort of an important sort of dialogue there for us to engage in. I mean, for example, in the pig meat industry, you know, what would be a just you know, business model, you know, and you know, involving all the different stakeholders. And of course, there are many you know, examples out there uh, of working towards social, social justice. You know, we've seen a resurgence in you know, fair trade with a capital F. You know, and uh, capital, you know, fair trade labelling. But again, the challenge for the fair labelling movement, as, as I understand when you read their annual reports, is they still struggle with how to scale it up, you know, get it sort of become bigger. And we see, you know, in sort of, um, in, in sort of across, you know, developing countries, the rise of the food sovereignty movement as pioneered by the Via Campesina. And we've also seen, you know, these debates come more sort of um, put on to more centre stage with the work of the right to food by the UN rapporteurs. And of course, to me, one of the critical parts of this dialogue has been the work of um, NGOs globally. Now, unfortunately, it's like, I'm, so my languages are very poor, so I can only look at English language uh, NGOs. But I'm always amazed by the, you know, the range and scope of uh, NGO movements, particularly in food, and, you know, that have emerged you know, across the globe and the work they do. And I think you know, we, there's work there done to talk, try and understand the, the, the work of all these different organisations internationally. And then what is the role of business? Because we are talking about workers and labour. So you know, we have to engage with business. So how do we do this? You know, how can we possibly you know, sort of, um, you know, work with business? I mean, should it be through CSR activities? And if you read CSR reports, I mean, within their own businesses, there has been movement in terms of diversity of workforce, uh, role of women in particular, uh, you know, perhaps working with smallholders, and you know, but again, it's all to do with risk management in supply chains, and alternative business models, you know, the global and the local. And what is the role of consumers as well? You know, how powerful is that consumer voice? So I'm told I just have two minutes, so I'm just going to um, sort of move on very quickly. And I just want to sort of, I just chose two examples to illustrate some of the complexities in this, in, this, in this issue. And one was a study of the wages of tea workers. And you see a number of studies like this where NGOs are partnering with business organisations to try and engage with um, working conditions and wages in different industry sectors. And this is one from the tea, uh, between the Ethical Tea Partnership, which includes the world's leading tea companies, and Oxfam, and they were looking at uh, working conditions on selected tea estates in Africa, Indonesia, and um, in, in India. And here, they, what they were confronting was that minimum wages often fell to meet the basic wage of workers and their families. So the problem here they found in these sort of countries, in these sort of um, bi businesses, was that minimum wages, even though minimum wages are being met, they're set so low they don't, you know, they don't allow families and workers to even to like reproduce themselves, and so this is the you know, fundamental problem. We may have minimum wage legislation, but it's just not enough. And that's where the living wage comes in. 
But of course, with the living wage, you know, it's, there's no accepted definition of what a living wage is, and, and it tends to vary from country to country. And then the problem came was that in these, in these plantations, um, tea workers, um, because of this minimum wage problem, were, were often found not to get any more money, even though they were fair trade or rainforest alliance or U UTC certified, because the condition of fair trade was just that the wages met minimum wages. And so, so this is a, a new challenge you know, for these certifying authorities to try and engage with this problem. And then it also came to, they found in this work, that it's actually hard even to work out what are the wages of tea workers or plantation workers because of the sort of conditions under which they work. You know, some get some sort of benefits, say living in dormitories we've heard and other things. So it's very hard to even work out the wages. And so they concluded that, um, you know, that they needed sort of more consistent approaches in the auditing wages. So you need to somehow evaluate this. There seems to be some mechanism to monitor and evaluate. And also to improve the understanding and measurements of wages. So that comes to this idea of what's unjust and what's just in terms of wages, in this case, in tea plantations. And also there was a problem in, you know, in terms of dialogue between the, you know, the different sectors and stakeholders and actors involved. And so this was also still a critical issue. Okay, so I only have a very short time. I'm just going to go on to my conclusions. So I, there's, there's sort of many examples of this, and what I do is I put a link to a, a book chapter which I wrote last year, which has a lot more of these types of examples, so it's giving more background. So, but what I'm not sure of, because I've, you know, I'm sort of only you know, started to look at this, I'm not you know, involved in any detailed research into this area. So, you know, so are these sort of engagements with NGOs and business and chain, you know, trying to address working conditions, you know, is this a, a trend, <laughs> you know, or is it just sort of a, you know, a sort of a tip of an iceberg, you know, underneath not very much is going on really. So I, I can't sort of, you know, get any feel for that, you know. But there are many examples of things going on and happening. And I suppose the challenge is, is how to, how can we engage further with those and uh, work with those and see if other industries can sort of um, use these models and structures. And there are examples where this has happened. But I think, you know, again from my reading, should not underestimate the challenge you face by this or the struggle. Often these, pr these processes evolve after years and years of struggle and hugely unjust working conditions. And I think it's, um, you know, as academics perhaps, we could working with stakeholders to redefine what are the duties and benefits and responsibilities within food system structures. And even though it's, uh, you know, as um, you know, my view, sort of, you know, I can be very quite critical, Nestle and their shared value, you know, that is, you know, for a company like Nestle, who just, you know, wouldn't even, wouldn't even consider a fair trade, you know, 10 years ago, but it to engage with, you know, a, a system called shared, you know, shared value, you know, even though with all of its flaws, is a major sort of change in thinking. And you see a number of corporations are doing this. Um, although, you know, there's, there's sort of, there's very varied um, levels of success. And so in this sense, I see social justice as fairness as a tool that might open up dialogue to speed up and scale up. It's always the problem in food problems and crises. You see lots of little things, but how can you speed up and how can you scale up you know, measures to address the inequalities and unfairness faced by food workers. So finally, you know, I think this dialogue, you know, it needs to be opened up, in, not just in, you know, in agricultural basis, but in terms of food retailing, food service, as well as processing agriculture. And by addressing social justice as fairness for food workers, this also doesn't ignore environmental and human health issues, in fact, it engages with those dialogues. And the last point I want to make is this one. Is I think you know, there's some urgency in opening up this dialogue because as I see, see particularly in a country like the United Kingdom, the new agenda, you know, the Feed the World agenda, is all about food security and sustainability, this new agenda that's emerging. You see in government policy like its agro-tech strategy and so on. Yet this whole idea of the social side of food is ignored again completely and um, and I think you know sort of there's 
you know, a pressing need that this should be part of this new debate that's going on around food security as broadly defined you know, across countries like the United Kingdom. So thank you very much.